You guys hear me all right? Okay, so I'll say it again. Welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming to our final board presentations. Uh, the students have a lot prepared for today. I just wanna make sure to thank all the board members for all their support and help and mentorship of the students this year. And also um, we have our new class of TCM also here. So thank you guys for showing up as well. And so with that, I'm gonna let you guys get started. The economics team is gonna start first. Is Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be going over the fiscal year today performance for the planning capital management. It's an honor to have you all here today as we present this, and I hope it's going to be a fun couple hours for all of us. Um, so I'm just first going to. There you go. That's good. Okay. So we're going to first uh, go over the economic overview. It's going to be followed by the. <laughs> TCM bond team's performance. We're going to go into equity and then we're going to finish it off strong with the President Scholar. So first off, we're going to start off with the economic review and I'm Era. I'm Baida. And I'm Luz. So first we're going to introduce what were the expectations going into both fall and spring and what did we actually see? So going into fall, even though we're all rookie investors, we tried making some sort of probable economic outlook that would help guide us throughout the semester. So we expected successful vaccination rollout and the Delta variant becoming more manageable to result in um, economies reopening successfully. We also see households having a high savings rate throughout the pandemic and stimulus packages really increase uh, household wealth throughout the pandemic. And we thought that this, coupled with economic reopenings, would really push consumer and business spending. So overall, we expect the GDP to reach uh, historical levels of growth, 2 to 3% per year. Uh, we knew that interest rates would inevitably have to increase, but it was very hard to try to predict when and at what pace that would happen. And we also did expect inflation to be more um, transitory than persistent. However, what happened in spring? So many of our predictions in regards to a strong economy actually came true or stands true today. We saw strong GDP growth of 2.3% in Q3 and GDP growth of 6.9% in Q4. We also saw the Fed keeping interest rates very low despite a strong uh, labor market and this really helped push uh, consumer spending. However, our predictions regarding inflation were a little bit too optimistic and during fall we saw inflation started picking up, raising concerns that it was um, more persistent and more and higher than we expected it to be. So knowing what we know um, and in fall, so what we learned in fall, how did we take this into our spring outlook? Uh, so as inflation started picking up, we did expect the Fed to start initiating bond tapering, and we also expected them to increase interest rates, but at a moderate pace. We did see supply chain disruption as a major concern, and we did think that shortages would disrupt markets, but also multiple sectors. Now, however, despite this, we did still think that the economy would go grow strong, as it is a consumer-driven economy, and... Um, we still saw strong fundamentals such as low unemployment and corporate profits growing at 25% year over year in 2021. However, what actually happened in spring? So I don't think anyone really could have predicted the type of spring that we saw and our predictions were not very aligned with what actually happened. So in the first quarter of 2022, GDP actually saw negative growth of 1.4% uh, instead of the strong economy that we had predicted. However, it is worth noting that the negative growth was attributed mostly to net trade and also slower inventory accumulation, and that some of um, the fundamentals was still driving the market, such as demand and business inventory or business investment growth was still growing strong. Uh, we also saw unemployment reach new lows and the job market strengthened. Uh, however, as Russia invaded Ukraine, there was more pressure on inflation and the Fed really had to ramp up its um, interest rates increases. So that was way more aggressive than we thought it was going to be. So moving over how we think all this is going to play out in the long term, Luz is going to discuss that later. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Vida, who's going to discuss more sector-specific um, performance. 
Thank you, Ada. So let's discuss a bit about the market, specifically the sector's performance. So as you can see, the majority of the sectors this year struggled and they actually saw negative returns in the double digits. We would like to take a deeper dive on this, discuss a little bit about the sectors and how they overall um, market activity and all the, also the global events have impacted the sectors, but also specifically uh, energy, technology and communications. So starting us off with energy. Uh, the sector soared this year, seeing a gain of 55%. Uh, we attribute this to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, driving up prices as supply became uncertain, and energy companies are seeing corporate earnings reach um, higher than normal levels. Other sectors, such as technology, have suffered from the increase in inflation, which has driven up short-term interest rates. Uh, their valuations have come down significantly as previous growth projections have become too optimistic as central banks raise interest rates to usually cool down the economy. And then lastly, outside of being negatively impacted by rising interest rates, uh, the communication sector faced sector-specific news, such as antitrust regulations and the new competition limiting uh, certain companies' pricing power. However, we are not implying that there is a recession nearby, but it is interesting to note that the sectors that are seen to perform strong, usually during a recession, such as healthcare, utilities, and staples, are the sectors that are actually performing well here since September, uh, just behind energy. Uh, in a growing economy, consumer discretionary and technology are the two sectors that usually perform well. And with uh, Lou's gonna be, we'll be talking about the outlook very uh, soon, but we just wanted to give some of our opinions for the incoming uh, class of 2023, just to kind of give them some gauge on how they could potentially consider positioning the three portfolios uh, in the various stages of the economic cycle. Now I'll hand it over to Luz to talk a little bit about the risks and opportunities ahead. Okay, thank you, Vaida. So when taking all of this into consideration, we did um, list them into risks and opportunities moving forward. Thanks. So the big picture um, for risks, we do see the Fed's monetary plan, supply chain issues, um, geopolitical tensions, and inflation playing a huge role on the more riskier side. Whereas for opportunities, on the other hand, um, we do see that with a strong labor market um, and rising income and dr will drive spending, we did list supply chain issues and geopolitical um, tensions as a possible scenario that they do ease quicker than anticipated, as well as consumer demand for goods and services remaining strong. Based on these risks and opportunities, we did come up with three um, different outlooks being our bear, our base, and our bull. Um, our, ba our base case being our most probable outlook, uh, we do expect the Fed to raise interest rates at a slightly higher um, pace than what was predicted following their March meeting. Instead of a Fed funds rate of 2 to 2.25 percent by the end of 2022, we do expect it to be more aligned with the Fed funds rate of, with the current future Fed futures expectations of 2.6 percent. We expect this coupled with supply chain issues, um, uh, supply chain disruptions, and geopolitical tensions to cause GDP growth to be around one to 2% in the following years, however, not being in the negative territory. With less economic activity and higher interest rates, we do expect inflation to cool down and to be around two to 3% mark by the, by the end of our three to five year outlook. Concerning supply chain disruptions, um, these will most uh, probably be very disruptive in the following one to two years, but we do expect them to somewhat ease in the three to five years. And if this does not plan out, we do have a bear and a bull case. Our bear case being very bearish, uh, meaning that if the Fed, um, the Fed pushes us into a recession, if they um, raise interest rates very aggressively, as well as the geopolitical tensions creating even more uncertainty than what we see now. And lastly, supply chain issues remaining the same. For our bull case, we are very, uh, uh, we, would, we, would rem we would remain very optimistic, uh, meaning no recession ever happened. Um, the interest rates do go to the Fed's long run target of 2.25 to 2.5%. And lastly, uh, no supply chain disruptions and long run inflation at 2 to 3%.
With that, uh, the economic team would like to conclude our economic review and open the floor to any questions. What was your, uh, in one of your scenarios, and I missed which scenario it was in, you, uh, you thought inflation would come down. What's your rationale for, for that? So inflation, so in our base case, we kind of argued for inflation coming down to like two, three percent or slightly higher than historical normalcy levels. So it's come down from eight to three. Yeah, but in like mm, five years, probably four to five years, okay. we have our three to five year outlift, but it's probably going to be by the end of that. So we do think that the Fed raising, um, we're raising interest rates and also like slowing the economy overall. Uh, coupled with hopefully supply chain disruptions easing in five years will help bring down um, inflation. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, I think, the, on the supply chain. I know you have not maybe given as much attention to the issues specifically regarding China and the shutdown of the factories. So, can you talk a little bit more about how much you factored that into your supply chain issues? And uh, what kind of a risk are you looking at, especially in the short term? Yeah, so I think for China, definitely there's zero, like COVID policy has really made a lot, like created a lot of issues over there with them, especially Shanghai shutting down as well. It's obviously a big part of the global supply chain issues that we have. I think um, for our inflation outlook, China plays a huge part, but when looking to the China situation, we're more trying to position our portfolios uh, to kind of be wary of which holdings we have that could be um, affected by that situation. So rather than trying to predict what's going to happen over there, we try to be cautious about whatever exposure we have over there and kind of um, look for other opportunities where we are more certain. Thank you, economic team. So now the TCM bond team would like to run you through our performance, as well as talk about some more in-depth in depth data and the future for our portfolio that we'd like to recommend for the next class. My name is Nicholas Leka. We just met Ada Tobrand, and I'm joined today by... Oh, Christian. <laughs> Christian. <laughs> yeah. Without ado, let's get right into it. But before we start, I really want to remind everyone of the TCM bond team's objective that we made in the fall. So the promise we made was to strive to perform, outperform the benchmark by 1% through defensive duration management and offensive credit management. Like I said, we'll get more into the meat and potatoes later, but just want to remind you all of the promise we made. Yeah, so I'm just going to quickly go over the agenda for today. We're going to start off with a very quick recap of the key performance driver that we've had throughout these two semesters. We're going to go over allocation, how it differs from the last class allocation, and then also the benchmark. We're going to look at performance and really dive deep into what drove our uh, portfolio performance these two semesters. Some notable trades. Uh, we're going to go into leaders and laggards, see what performed the best and what performed the worst. And then we're going to go uh, and do a reflection on what we learned throughout the year and then also a recommendation to the next TCM class. So starting off with a quick recap of the key performance drivers. Um, so in our economic uh, overview, we did predict that it would be rising interest rates. So the bond team um, held our duration significantly below the benchmark both these semesters, and this proved to be very successful for us, and it was the largest uh, performance driver. We also want to give a shout out to Jeff for his cash injection in November, because cash attribution proved to be our second largest performance driver. <laughs> Uh, so moving along to sector allocation, you can see the last uh, year's class in dark blue, our class in um, yeah, light blue, and then the benchmark in orange. So the largest or the main difference between last year's class was a 7% increase in our investment grade corporates, uh, which also increased our overweight compared to the benchmark. And this decision stemmed from um, record low treasury yields, as well as um, strong conviction in the economic environment. So we wanted to take on additional credit uh, risk while also while still looking for fundamentally strong companies. However, this decision and being overweight in both investment grade and high yield corporates proved um, to hurt us a lot this year as the Russia-Ukraine crisis heightened volatility and the Fed rising interest rates really made spreads shoot up. Um, the second main difference is a decrease in non-US holdings as we wanted to limit systematic and inflation risk. 
Um, however, we still have a significant overweight to the benchmark, and this is because we believe some exposure to non-US building is important for diversification, and also it is a good sector for that offers additional yield. Um, the third very minor change was a decrease in treasury that also further uh, increased our underweight. Um, this proved to be uh, profitable for us this year. Um, but moving forward, as, in, as yield started picking up early March and the 10 year is currently yielding around 2.9%, we are looking to add um, close to benchmark duration or a little bit shorter than duration treasury yields or treasury um, um, to kind of level out and not have as much of the uh, underweight. I'm going to pass it over to Chris to discuss some more portfolio performance. All right, so I'll be going over the fiscal and date performance for this year. Um, unfortunately, our portfolio took a beating this year and returned negative 7.38%. However, we would like to highlight that we managed to beat the benchmark by 2.06%. And as you can see on the far right corner, our portfolio's duration was around 5.06 years with a credit quality rating of A- minus against the benchmark 6.48 duration with a credit quality of double A. Uh, this figure is actually mainly below five years for most of the year. We try to keep it within a 70 to 75%. And it was only due to recent trades and several holdings reallocating the funds that this figure went above five years. Um, so at the beginning of the year, the bond team developed and adopted a below benchmark strategy to mitigate interest rate risk. Um, this strategy largely remained unchanged throughout the year as we believe the Federal, the Federal Reserve needed to act on inflation as the economy saw signs of improvement in Q3 2021. And so as you can see, the portfolio's duration largely remained a safe distance away from the Barclays aggregate, only moving upward, upwards in like through October through no, December before quickly falling again in January. And 2022 saw this strategy prove very helpful as several factors impacted the bond market, uh, such as the surging commodity prices as a result of the Ukraine and Russian war. And we like to just remind everybody that the trades this year were made with the effort to try to keep the duration within our desired range. Um, so treasuries were, were very volatile throughout 2021, uh, particularly in the second half. And as a result, we wanted to overweight the credit sector and underweight treasuries. Um, however, things like Delta and Omicron continued to beat down on volatility and uncertainty and they brought the yields down. Uh, and it was only until the Federal Reserve introduced um, that they were gonna introduce rate hikes and remove quantitative easing that the treasury yield saw a strong movement upwards. And while the yield suggests a strong, like suggests a recovering economy, 2022 saw a drastic increase and ultimately saw the bond market sell off. And that's where our duration strategy kicked in and paid off. All right, so I'll be going over credit strategy. Um, so a critical measure for this is the investment grade and high yield corporate option adjusted spreads. As you can see, the spreads narrowed in 2021 all the way until around the June um, area. And then from there, they gradually began to increase and it's likely due to just investors seeking higher yields in order to compensate for taking on more credit risk. And we decided to move away from high yield credit as we did not want to take on more credit risk as we believe that investment grade corporates would benefit from the recovering economy. But um, sometime around November 2021, um, the spreads on investment grade corporates began to increase aggressively, and this is likely in line with the treasury yields moving upwards. And ultimately, this saw our overweight to investment grade backfire. So some notable changes that we did this semester when going over the buys, we did buy T. Rowe Price Floating Rate Fund. Uh, we bought Edison International maturing in 2028, Bank of America maturing in 2030, and Charter Communications maturing in 2031. Some of the most notable sells was the Matthews Asia Total Return Bond Fund, uh, as well as Qualcomm maturing in 2025. The Invesco Preferred Stock ETF, or PGX, has been sent up to the board and it has got one um, approval. And Nick will talk about later what we're going to replace 
PDX with. So as you guys see this chart or graph, I'm sure you're all thinking that it's not something to be proud of, but I do want to remind everyone that we actually did beat the benchmark by 2.06% in a very difficult environment. Um, so the performance this year is something that we are proud of still. Um, but virtually all of our holdings suffered from the same systematic risk, which is that of rising interest rates. And, and that was the number one um, driver of our performance. So. Now, Nick will be discussing some of the leaders and laggards. Well, I hope you're all ready for some very in-depth performance details. So I'd like to remind everyone, TCM Bond Portfolio actually had two holdings that were positive for the fiscal year. The first being Providence Health Services, which is a tax exempt bond issuance from a nonprofit healthcare system in Washington. This bond has a double A minus credit rating with a duration of 0.41 years. I'm sure you're all saying, how does this have a duration of 0.41 years when it matures in 2034? This is due to the fact that this bond is callable at par October 1st, 2022. Given the current market sentiment and price levels that we've seen, we are confident that this bond will be called away at the call date. However, we still face some extension risk, which will never completely go away. The other bond, or the other holding that we had with the positive return was t price floating rate. This had a 13 basis point return for the period, has a single D credit rating and duration of 0.48 years. There is a bank loan fund. So the main factor for this 0.48 duration is because of the underlying loans rebasing on their floating rate. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to go forward yet. Um, you'll also notice that even though it is a single B rating, it is still pretty high up the capital structure because of the fact that the underlying loans are secured. So there is a better chance in the event of a default, there will be some recovery. Now I'll take you through our biggest losers. We have to acknowledge them. Everybody loses sometimes. Our second worst loser is Western Asset Core Plus. Um, it returned negative 14.13% for the period with an A plus credit rating and an above benchmark duration of 7.47 years. In, in full transparency, the TCM bond team was unable to find a suitable replacement for this, as we noticed that it had been a laggard for five straight, five straight months because of its A plus credit rating and above benchmark duration. However, moving forward, we would like to recommend a hold for the security as it still is poised to succeed in the event that interest rates begin falling or spreads begin tightening, and hopefully both. And now our biggest loser, we've already mentioned this is next on the chopping block for our team. It is our Invesco preferred stock ETF with a return of negative 15.26%. You will notice a double B plus credit rating because of the length of where it is in the capital structure. And it is almost entirely comprised of preferred stock. Again, with this, we tried to, we wanted to get this security sold earlier on in the year because investor appetite for defined cash flow equities seemed to plummet as treasury yields and credit rating, or I'm sorry, Treasuries and corporate credits began rising in yield. However, we have mentioned that we already received one approval from the board, thank you, Annie, to sell this. And we are hoping to replace it with Oracle maturing 2024 with a 3.4% coupon and Netflix with a five and seven, eight percent coupons maturing in 2028. That trade would ultimately take our yield tours down by just a few basis points and increase our duration by 0 0.02 years, leaving the portfolio mostly unchanged and reducing much of the volatility we've experienced. All right. So as the year comes to an end, we'd like to provide some recommendations and some reflections for the next class. So one of the most challenging tasks at the beginning of the year was see how we wanted to position our portfolio. And obviously one of the critical factors for this is to create an economic outlook. And we created one, uh, but things got in the way. Uh, we saw this year, we saw things like Evergrande, inflation, Ukraine and Russian war, many things. And while we mostly had it right in fall, uh, 2022 saw that economic landscape drastically change and we did not adjust adequately. Um, for the next, oh, it's getting opportunity cost, never mind. Um, so as you, you, for the next TCMers, you're going to hear this a lot, but the longer you take on trades and ideas, the increased likelihood that you're going to miss out on a good buying or selling opportunity. Um, so as Nick highlighted before, PGX, uh, preferred stock really hurt us this year. And we really wanted to get out of it this, but we didn't have the replacement ideas ready in time. And going over the teamwork. Yeah, you guys are a team for the whole year. So you guys are going to have to just learn from each other. Everybody's good at something, whether it be presentation skills, modeling, writing skills. Just be a team and just learn from each other. Um, next. So the, one of the, the key factors for next year uh, is going to be taking a side on whether the Federal Reserve is going to be able to tame inflation by introducing timely rate hikes 
or will they have to crush the economy to do so? Uh, Nick's going to elaborate on this later on. Uh, portfolio construction. We recommend being below the benchmark as we still think that inflation and interest rates are still going to fuel interest rate risk. However, if recession odds increase, then we'd recommend moving closer to the benchmark. And lastly, we'd like to focus on higher quality and things that might be fundamentally strong throughout a recession rather than chase yield. Yeah. So this question came up in last year's TCM bond presentation. And I believe it was Mr. Goldblatt who decided to ask, why do we even own bonds? Well, the TCM bond team wants to tell you why we own bonds. And it's because the future is highly uncertain and our crystal ball is really just a magic eight ball in disguise. <laughs> and if you can't see that, our magic eight ball says, you better not tell us now. <laughs> so in the event that the Fed and Jerome Powell are able to achieve a soft landing, much in very in line with the base case that our economic team presented. Our recommendations for our portfolio, we'd recommend to continue monitoring investment grade and high yield credit spreads very closely, as it has been very volatile, especially given the speed at which interest rates have risen. Should they increase, we would recommend reducing the duration of those holdings and possibly increasing the quality of investment rate corporates, as well as very, very closely monitoring our split rated holdings, as we have two of them. So we would still recommend under benchmark duration near where we're currently at, or if you guys have any new economic developments tailored to your needs. We also recommend maintaining the A minus credit rating of the overall portfolio. So next, I wanna talk about a crash and burn. I don't like using the big R word. I think we're very much like gamblers at a craps table. You say the R word, it's like saying seven. So <laughs> portfolio recommendation for a hard landing. So if the Fed and Jerome Powell decide to become the second coming of Paul Volcker and crush the economy to tame inflation, we would highly recommend increasing treasury and securitized exposure, as well as the duration of those holdings. We would recommend reallocating capital from our heavy overweight and investment grade and high yield credits to do so. We'd also recommend increasing that portfolio duration near or above benchmark in this scenario. It's too early for us to tell, so we really hope the next team has better insight with leading indicators. We'd also recommend in this scenario, if needed, the weighted average credit quality increased A plus or double A minus if it gets that bad. But now that you've heard us talk for a long time, we'd like to thank you for your time and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Last time I asked the same question and I'm gonna ask it again, why bonds at all? And I'm not being facetious, I'm just asking the question. Um, I was happy with your presentation. I was unhappy with your expectation of outperforming uh, fall in the bond, you know, fall uh, a, negative, a negative return on the investments. Um, underperforming, to say to a client, I've only lost you 2% and the market lost you 7%, we've done very well, is not what you say. You basically say, we lost X, they lost Y. You don't say you did well. Losing money is not nice. Um, so that's my first question. The second question I have is, you said you could not find an alternative to one of your investments. Why can't you just go to cash when you, don't, you want to sell something? Why do you have to find something instantly? Anybody want to respond? <laughs> yeah. So I think a main conviction, especially for us, for the sell of uh, Western Asset Corp Plus, which is the one we really mentioned that about, as well as preferred stock, is we didn't want to have a large cash balance sitting in the portfolio just because of maybe our ignorance for not being able to say, like, hey, we sell for cash. I, I don't think you guys are ignorant at all. I think you're really smart guys. And uh, guys, as I'm just using the generic term, men and women. And you saw interest rates rise and you did nothing. So I'm not a happy camper. You should have sold immediately. Okay. Um, so do you guys agree with the economics team outlook? Correct. Yeah. We are pretty hopeful that we won't be, you know, like the 60% 60 60 chance that the economic team assigned to a base case is sort of not in a perfect soft landing or return to the bull market of 2019, but a, uh, the Fed will tame inflation, things will start to get back to normal. It just might take longer than everyone officially or originally anticipated. Okay. So, what, and remind me, was the base case lower growth, lower inflation? The base case is um, economic growth, GDP growth of 1% to 2% um, every, like, consistently uh, every year. Um, inflation in the long run, 2 to 3%, but that inflation will kind of eat away at economic growth. Um, but yeah. 
Okay. So how would you say that compares to consensus at this point? You don't know. So you I, don't I, know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know any of the consensus numbers. I okay. Don't. I guess I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, is I, when I saw the economics presentation, I kind of took it as lower growth, lower inflation, yet you're telling me to stay short on duration. And I guess I would just want to hear how you guys are thinking about marrying those two ideas. I think, I think it wasn't really portrayed, but I think what the economics team meant to say was we're in a real nominal GDP or positive nominal GDP. However, for, you know, possibly the next three to five years, it could be negative real GDP because of inflation. You mentioned that you were overweight to IG and it, and it backfired, you know, probably mostly because of your Western asset bond position, but I, I'm going to be a little opposite Raymond in that this is not a hedge fund. This is not an absolute return fund. You are managing a fully invested portfolio. So in, in a rising interest rate environment, your only tool is duration. And that's where all your edge was. And in, 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 the industry, in the mutual fund industry, in bonds, you beat your benchmark by 200 basis points. Uh, you'd be like the king of the PIMCO bond floor. <laughs> um, so going forward, Fed says they're jacking up rates. By mid-July, we could be at a 175 Fed funds rate. How much do you all think their policy is priced into the market? And I don't know if any of you have studied the history of the Fed. You talked about could they engineer a soft landing? Any of you know what the odds are on that given their history? Some to none. And yeah. It was only done by Greenspan. So if you're betting on a soft landing, you are betting on the wrong horse. Hello everyone, my name is Amir. I'm John. And I'm James. We'll be your captains for today's voyage. We are your Spring Equity PM team. So before we get started, we just wanted to go ahead and thank the board of directors. Thank you guys for being here today, as well as the past two semesters, your advice, guidance, patience has been, it's been priceless. Thank you very much. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about our overall equity strategy and how we've decided to fare the seven C's along with our portfolio characteristics some leaders and laggards. And at the end, our navigator, John, will give us some guidance for the future. So it wasn't so long ago that uh, the equity team, us sailors, found ourselves at, the, at a tavern at the bottom of the barrel <laughs> of juice. And uh, we came across the master of the sailors guild. And he told us, I'm not a big fan of using macros, but now would be a time to consider them. And we took this- I've never seen that again. <laughs> Well, perhaps after this year, right? But uh, we took this to heart and we decided what we wanted to do differently this spring is have a blended approach to our portfolio. And that was to understand macroeconomic trends that we saw happening in the world, deciding whether or not they are long-term or short-term, and then decidingly allocating our weightings uh, in the portfolio differently. So for example, we went underweight in tech and we went overweight in industrials and materials, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. After that, we would, of course, have an equal emphasis on both the macros and also company specific news. So we would allow our analysts to have uh, stock picking freedom and then come back together in the end and decide whether or not these are investment ideas that we wanted to pursue or not. Throughout the year, there are many macro um, developments that we had to keep track of. So, uh, for example, um, Starting in July, the Delta variant rapidly spread. Uh, then we saw energy prices soaring and supply chain bottlenecks worsening, which placed pressure on corporate profits. Although starting the new year, the economic conditions did not ease. In February, we saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which added to the global economic uncertainty and fueled inflationary pressures. Then we saw the Fed's late response to inflation with its 25 basis point rate hike in March. And most recently, its first 50 basis point rate hike in over 20 years. In the fall, some trades included Citigroup due to a slow and steady turnaround, TGX due to higher growth prospects with its uh, European um, expansion. 
and some cells included Pulte Holmes and Xylem as the PMs identified deterring fundamentals. And these cells have done well for us. For example, Pulte Holmes and Xylem are both down over 30% since the time of exiting these trades. In the spring, the new PMs added a position in Tapestry and Ring, which we will soon discuss in the later slides. And one proposed sell uh, was in Activision, as we saw increased risks of the Microsoft acquisition getting blocked by antitrust uh, regulators. And one sell included Meta, as we saw uh, declining user base growth and also its large investments into the unproven metaverse. I apologize, I messed up on that part. But one of our uh, one of our top down plays is uh, Ring ETF, which is actually a. Come here, stay this. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Sorry, one of our one of our proposed buys is Ring, which is a ETF that is invested in gold mine gold mining businesses all around the world. Uh, the reason for this is our investment rationale is essentially top down. In this case, we want to be able to hedge our portfolio, which we actually use Spy as a uh, proxy in our correlation matrix because it is very, it's our benchmark and it's pretty correlated, it's pretty well correlated. Another thing too, is that it's a non-correlated asset. We wanna be able to de-risk the portfolio through this diversification. However, on the bottom upside, 40% of the exposure within the ETF is between Newmont and Barrick Gold, which both are great companies that are actually providing more sharehold value due to their increasing dividend payouts. And Tapestry is one example of our high conviction trades with a bottom-up focus. So we like Tapestry for several reasons. First, the company is trading at a deep discount with a free cash flow yield well over 10%. Second, the company has industry-leading gross margins, which is a testament to the company's brand and pricing power, which we view as especially important in this inflationary environment. And lastly, the company successfully turned around its brands which helps support its double digit revenue growth rates, significant margin expansion, and its record levels of working capital efficiency. So here's a brief overview of our current ship compared to the benchmark ship. As you can see, we are underweight in tech. We are overweight in financials, which we'll get into a little bit later, and we are underweight in energy. However, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the presentation. Sorry, I can't see the screen. Let's see the screen. I can see it. You can see it? I can see it. Other people can see it. Raymond, I'm afraid it might be you. Yeah. What? The other Zoomers can see. Oh, okay. Sorry. No worries. Um, now, as we move on to portfolio characteristics, let's take a look at our portfolio itself. We see that our portfolio has a dividend of 1.1 compared to the S&P 500 of 1.5. And we're a little more conservative with price per earnings at 18.4 compared to 20.2. And this also stems within the next forward year. And if we were to divide the portfolio into growth and value, we would see that the portfolio is 53% growth and 47% value. And additionally, we have that 1% cash, and these are rounded numbers. As we look over the performance, we see that fall semester had a complete bottom-up approach. And again, I want to remind everyone that we were a mixed blended approach. TCM was able to perform a 6% return over that period compared to the benchmarks 11.58. And TCM also had a higher standard deviation and lower sharp ratio. As we move toward the spring performance, we see that the return closely followed the benchmark with a turn of negative 12.97 compared to the SP 500 is negative 12.88. Now, with all this talk, of, oh, sorry. Now we'll talk about our five-year performance. On the chart below, we have the percent increase of a dollar in a five-year time span. We have fall 2021 PMs coming in on the first line and spring 2022 PMs coming in on a second line. And we see at the numbers, our fiscal basis, we had a, about 5% difference on a fiscal standard. However, we stand on tall shoulders of success with a 1.5% difference over a five-year period now let's talk about why we're mentioning S&P so much and maybe why we should mention others. So TCM has in this IPS states that we should follow the S&P 500. However, we believe that Russell 1000 is a better benchmark for the portfolio itself. The S&P 500 is heavily weighted in a few companies being these mega cap companies of both technology and Amazon. 
However, we believe the Russell 1000 is a better, more comprehensive approach when measuring performance of this. These numbers were updated today, and we see that on the year-to-date basis, we lagged behind the Russell 1000 by 0.2%. We also don't believe that Russell 1000 growth or value are, such, are good indexes to use because they fall under one category and may exclude some stocks that we may include in the portfolio. So let's talk about how we got here. And we see on an allocation effect level, we miss Paradise Island. We miss the energies that perform phenomenally over the, sec the period and our overweight in consumer staples helped us allow get some gains. And on a security basis, we see that Infotech was our largest detractor, contributing about negative 4.5%, 4.05% of our performance. And on a security level, we have the tail of the whale, that is PayPal. And we'll talk a little bit more about PayPal in the PS to the end to the Pacifics. Thank you, Swan. Um, and we also see that our other three top laggers are also in Infotech. And our largest contributor to gains was Steel Dynamics. Now, Amir, where should we go from here? Glad you asked, James. So here, if our journey could continue, here are a couple things that we would do to uh, if we had some more time. First, for financials, we would like to decrease to market weight just to be able to get in line with our benchmark. And in regards to healthcare, we would like to maintain an underweight just due to the fact that we are a small, smaller class, and if the next class is as small as ours, uh, it's a it's a stock picker sector, and it's a uh, in our opinion, a more difficult sector to understand than most others. So we would like to keep it underweight. And in energy, we would like to increase the market weight. With a difficult environment, we wanted to ensure the portfolio is well constructed to sail the waters for the next team. As we saw increased pressure from rising interest rates, we decided to hold back on adding high valuation names and we underweighted the infotech sector. And with the increasing economic uh, uncertainty, we decided to maintain our overweight position in the staple sector, which has many high quality names such as Costco and Walmart. And we also believe they can offset the inflationary pressures. And lastly, with the increasing risks that we are seeing in the markets, we believe our play on the gold miners ETF will mitigate risk and lead to future outperformance. And lastly, I'd like to conclude with some tips for the next class. So first, we think it is very important to monitor the economic conditions and implement it into your investment strategy, as there are many dynamic factors influencing today's markets. Second, it is crucial that you remain on your, on your toes as the environment is rapidly changing. And as we know, the markets do not wait for anyone. And lastly, it is imperative to work together as a team and delegate tasks, as this will help you execute trades faster and react quicker to the markets. And that concludes our presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I am uh, delighted after 10 years, I think, with, with Bob to actually hear that gold is going to get into your portfolio. So congratulations on, on the discovery. Um, I do, however, want to, <laughs> I do want to warn the team that um, in my experience, I have bought a gold share at $10 and I sold it and I sold it when it reached $300 and then I bought a share at $310 and I sold it at 10. <laughs> With a total up and down over a few years. The, the point of the story is that that is a cyclical play. And please, when we talk about cyclical plays, it means you have to set it at a certain point in time. It's not an Amazon or anything that will keep future earnings. It's very much a commodity is a wonderful, wonderful thing when you buy it at the bottom of the cycle and it goes to the top. I'm not sure where you're buying it, to be very honest. I think there's a super cycle in commodities, and I hope it works. Um, but just be wary of them. But uh, I think uh, nice job in terms of, 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 of discussion today. Thank you. Um, you broke it down by fall and spring. You guys clearly were way behind way, either benchmark in the fall, I believe. So... Um, where was where was your where was your biggest miss? What have you learned from that? You guys were six or seven hundred basis points behind the S and P. You can shout out to the previous team if you'd like to. Um, I would like to take a little bit on their behalf, and if they want to add in, they can. 
Um, so we saw PayPal as an opportunity. The stock came crashing down as they talked about their acquisition deal. Um, however, we believe and we trust our analysts with their work. And if they say that, you know, they believe that there's more upside potential than downside potential, then we're going to pursue opportunities. We realize that we're always going to make a mistake every now and then. It's not a perfect science. And we just trust our analysts and hope we work catching up falling knife. And if you want to add in, feel free to. And then to add to that, like last semester, all the laggers that we had, we knew we wanted to sell them, like for example, Activision earlier, but the whole time process of getting it up to the board and like the whole process was just too late and then we had to, which is why you see that performance with all those laggers that we had last semester were the ones we were planning to sell. So it's just the execution that didn't go as planned. And then just to recap that a little bit too, um, one of their, th their three detractors being Health Equity, Activision, and PayPal. Well, PayPal has still gone down since then. Activision had its deal with Microsoft bouncing the stock back up, and Health Equity has risen due to interest rates. And then Disney sucked too. <laughs> Disney does suck, but it's not the worst three. <laughs> <laughs> I I know Jeff said he will not talk macro very much, but he's he's been right, and this is all a macro market. Uh, unless you're pure value and 40% in energy, you're, you're suffering. There's not much going up. So where would you hand this off to the new team? What changes would you advise them to strongly take a look at it? And, and you're right. I mean, everything's happening faster these days. Your, your point about um, being on top of things. And I was gonna ask a similar question so it's actually almost the same as what bob was but you have positions in here that you know you could maybe they're being exited it's going to be like 10 percent of the portfolio of cash so the new team is either going to have to get up to speed quickly so we don't have delays like you guys have so i'm just curious what you know you might say to them right now if you're because uh you know uh, the market's not going to wait <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I'm curious if you have some thoughts real quick. I think which I think is your question. Yeah, one of the one of the best things that I could probably tell the the next class in terms of managing their securities, managing the portfolio that they'll be inheriting from us is to really really dig in on the macros and trying to understand the economic trends that you do see happening. I mean, like for example, our play on 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 gold, it's at first, we thought that it could be an inflation hedge, but we decided that there, there's not always a correlation between you know gold and inflation. I know that there's probably going to be a lot of discussion on whether or not it can be. So we decided to make it a lot more simple, simpler and really just look at our portfolio. Our portfolio, which is very, very heavily correlated to the S&P, which is very tech-centered, which hasn't been doing well, we decided to try and diversify that. Plays like that are something that's important that I think that, you know, we should try and look into understanding trends that you see there. And then also as well, Mr. Goldblatt was talking about the possibility, the, the potential of being in the early stages of a commodity cycle. And when, <clears throat> when you really look at it, um, a lot of the inflation numbers that we see at the moment, they're happening at, you know, the, the prices of commodities and energies. And the way I think historically that those work is they trickle down into the other parts of the economy. So perhaps maybe even looking into whether or not, will these numbers, these high prices, will they be sustained going forward? That's a bone I'd throw out. I could be wrong, but I like commodities. What's actually been sort of helpful though, as an equity PM is not necessarily just looking at the, the company specifics and being a bottom up stock picker, but when you understand the sectors, you kind of have a little bit of a cheat sheet and understanding most of the companies that are within a sector. So that's helped. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Pavano, and it's a great, great pleasure to tell you our story about investing in TCM's President Scholar portfolio. Next slide. I am joined today by Jordan Liu and Freddie Arroyo, who managed a portfolio in the fall, and Tuan Huang, along with myself, who joined Jordan this semester to manage the President Scholar portfolio. Okay. So this story touches on several aspects of our journey, such as our investment and objective strategy that we took over um, in J July 2021, 
as well as our investment decisions through the end of April 2022. We also touch on several portfolio characteristics, as well as where we missed the marks, as well as some spotlight um, leaders. And lastly, we do take away with some key um, values that we learned throughout our year, and we do provide some words of wisdom for the incoming class of TCM. Thank you, Luz. So for our portfolio, our first objective is to generate one scholarship of $7,000 per year. We feel honored that we can make a real impact on someone's life. The second objective is education. This is invaluable that we get hands-on experience from Professor Lucas without being hired by PIMCO. <laughs> to, make, to make that annual income, our strategy includes. Not yet. <laughs> Shifting well, okay. assess our location between stocks and bonds depending on our economic outlook. Rigorous diversification to create a portfolio that can provide a relatively predictable return across a variety of market environment. And prudent security selection, we try to identify individual stocks and bond funds that can deliver return near the 70-30 benchmark with below average risk. And to paraphrase Gordon Perfect, we aren't trying to be the smartest investor, but if we have a solid process, well executed, we should be successful over time. We are not trying to make the most profit either. We only try to make sure each year our return can give some students the opportunity to go to school. And to give you a roadmap of our top down, to give you a roadmap of our top down diversification oriented investment process. Here is a chart of our historic risk and return of the stocks currently held in our portfolio. We are clearly on the right track with many of our stock selection, but definitely hit some roadblock with several others. Stocks such as Microsoft and Waste Management are what we want more in our portfolio, while PayPal and Netflix are, have given us a very bumpy ride, with risk definitely overshooting return between January 2020 and April 2022. Now, Luz will go over our bond fund. Thank you, Tuan. So when looking at our bond fund efficient frontier, uh, we do we compared the annualized return and the standard deviations from the year um, January 2018 to April 2022. Um, based on the return versus volatility, we do see that our high yield um, bond fund, our floating rate bond fund, our USSA intermediate bond, and our uh, multi-sector bond fund are charting the course for our investment objective. And then while our Schwab US TIPS ETF did lead the way um, for the fiscal year, we do believe it is um, time to take profits. And whereas our preferred position, our preferred position, PFFD, uh, does generate the same returns as US IBX. However, considering its volatility, um, Considering it's volatility, volatility it does not align with our below average risk um, strategy. And then lastly, we do have our Matthews Asia Total Bond Return Fund, um, Mainex, which it did give us our annualized return of 5% throughout the year. Jordan will go more in depth later. Thank you, Lu Thank you, Luz. Now, if you can clap, I mean, if you can hear me clap once. <laughs> Perfect. It feels good doing that one more last time. I know half of us are falling asleep, but please bear with us. The road's just getting, the show's just getting started. Um, we have, I think, 50 minutes left for our presentation. So please prepare your caffeine. Um, yeah, so thank you, Luz. Our fiscal year to date clearly missed our near index target, underperforming our 70-30 benchmark by 421 basis points since June. While our sharp ratio is near the index, our info is low, our info ratio is low and negative, indicating a lack of skillful active management, particularly the last two years. Luckily, <laughs> we're firing on all cylinders. We have something that the other PMs don't have, 
And for those of you who were present with us in our wonderful fall presentation, alongside my um, other PM, Jordan Liu, may remember that our secret tool is sector allocation. I mean, uh, <laughs> being able to use <laughs> being able to use fixed income and equities, something that unfortunately the bond PMs and equity PMs aren't unable to do. This kind of gives us an advantage because um, this allocation did, although this allocation did hurt us in April, we generated nearly 60 basis per, um, basis points of excess return um, um, due to our shift from going 80-20 um, to 75-25. Now, Jordan, what did we do right and where did we go wrong this year? Thank you, Freddie. So I'll be kicking off the attribution analysis. I'll first be starting with the first contributor. Now, in the beginning months, we were still benefiting from recovery plays that the last class implemented. Securities like Netflix and Zoetis were leading our portfolio. While we later got burned due to our inability to remove many of these securities, we were benefiting from these firms when we inherited the portfolio. Now, due to the President's Scholars portfolio being overweight in energy, the next contributor we benefited from was the rise in oil prices from Russia-Ukraine war. Russia had previously provided 8% of the oil imported into the US. So when the US stopped these imports, Chevron and other energy companies really felt the benefits. But there are obviously many downsides to the war, which we'll be uh, discussing more on the detractor side. Luz will be finish up, finishing up the contributors. So our biggest contributor for the fixed income segment was our overweight in tips. We added the position back in March 2020 when um, bond yields were strongly negative due to recession fears because of COVID-19 shutdowns. Um, for the past two years, it has um, given us a 5% annualized return, proving that our uh, decision to keep tips was a wise decision throughout the year due to, as well as CPI data remaining elevated due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Next, we have Freddie with our first director. Thank you, Luz. Thank you, Jordan. I'm gonna talk briefly about Matthews Asia, which um, since Jordan's gonna go more into um, debt about it later on in the presentation, I don't wanna take away from his spotlight, but Matthews Asia is an Asia-focused bond fund with 62.6% of country exposure to um, China. And given the unexpected drama, um, Chinese, um, the, given the unexpected drama that we've experienced in China, the previous class bought Mainex to gain exposure to a growing part of the world that showed promise, while the U.S. growth was slow and steady. You know. Past PMs did did make um, look at the macro and then came to the conclusion that it was a good fit. But unfortunately, things happen. China's zero tolerance COVID nineteen policy has been of concern because China's sweeping lockdowns across the country have crimped manufacturing, which is why we want to rethink our current holdings within our portfolio. Companies and holdings such as Hasbro, which manufactures about sixty seven percent of its manufacturing to Chinese companies. The second detractor would be preferred stocks. The preferred stock fund PFFD was purchased in April 2021 when it became clear that the U.S. economy was reopening and interest rates would have to rise from the near zero levels created by the COVID-19 stimulus efforts. Thank you, um, Jerome Powell, for making the printer go burr. The previous PS team did a co correlation analysis that showed preferred stocks were negative, negatively correlated with the 10-year Treasury returns, leading them to add to the position to hedge interest rate risk while generating an attractive 5% dividend yield. The team realized that they were trading interest rate risk for stock market volatility, but underestimated the tail risk of extreme events leading to what we've experienced in the recent month. Because of that, our preferred stock position found ne um, nearly 30%, and the current team is really reevaluating the cost benefit of keeping this position. Now, Tuan will break down our results, starting with the equity segment of our portfolio. So, Tuan, take it away. Thanks, ladies. Last but not least is our security selection. This was the contributor earlier and a detractor recently. They had some pandemic, pandemic winners such as PayPal and Netflix really hurt us. They had a great run up during the pandemic, but now investors are reevaluating the profit potential of these businesses going forward. Now we will see the performance of our equity segment. Looking at the graph, we did well until recently. There were lots of periods that our portfolio outperformed the benchmark. We thought we had an old weather portfolio having similar return regardless of sunny days or stormy days, but it turned out to be a fair weather one. 
when those unexpected drama hit the portfolio, things went badly. As is discussed previously, because some pandemic winner did not live up to expectation, we underperformed the benchmark. Now, Jordan will discuss the detail of our characteristics. So while we were aiming for a 75% equity, 25% fixed income asset allocation, we are currently at 77 and 23. Now we aim for 75, 25 because it not only protected us from bond market headwinds, but it also gave us, prepared us for a potential equity market recovery. Now when the Fed provided insight on the rate hiking schedule, the bond market was plunged into turbulent waters for the next year or two. Moreover, there's still too much uncertainty within the equity markets with the Russia-Ukraine war and the Fed's war on inflation for us to really take a confident 80-20 stance. Now for our equities, our biggest sector deviation was Infotech at 6% underweight. Now the rest of our securities were more or less aligned with the most deviation coming out of discretionary financials and industrials, all 3% overweight. Our beta is neutral and our PE ratio is at 26.8 versus the benchmarks 19.94. Salesforce at 115.84 and Disney at 67 were two outliers that did help bring up our PE a little bit. Lastly, we do have a dividend yield of 1.73 versus the benchmarks 1.37. So we did beat them on that mark. Now in general, our securities that we kept from the COVID recovery plays are the ones that really burnt us the worst. Securities like Netflix, Chewy, Carnival, Hasbro, these are all securities that we plan to, or at least discuss, or moving from the portfolio, but we ultimately just missed our window of opportunity and got slammed for it. Now our leaders, we can, we can be mostly attributed to security selection. Uh, none of them are, are part of the same sector or industry. Chevron, Waste Management, CVS, Lockheed, and Apple were among our top five leaders. Now Tuan will give us a comment on one of our biggest laggings. So our worst lag of PayPal returned negative 70% over the fiscal year starting July 1st. Investors lost confidence in management guidance and believed the company lacked a sense of clarity around its strategic direct direction, shifting focus from net new account growth to engagement. Even though management outlook cut will position its share to outperform in the future, we think the road ahead will not be easy. We give a whole rating because the upside potential outweighs the downside risk, given the stock is trading at pre-pandemic level. And historically, PayPal has delivered outstanding outcome. As a fintech powerhouse, we believe PayPal current price is too cheap to sell. 80% of transactions are still done in cash globally. The opportunity ahead is huge, and we believe PayPal current price is just too cheap. So we want to hold on to the uh, position for a bit longer. Now, Jordan, you discuss our second lagger. As you can imagine, our next laggard was Netflix. Now the stock's turbulence really began when the quarter four earnings came out. And since then, all news, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Since then, okay, you want to see, yeah. There we go, okay. And since then, all news surrounding the firm has just been disappointment after disappointment. The latest story surrounding them has been their struggle to grow their subscriber base. Now they've attributed this to many things, but some of the most prominent reasons is increased competition, losing 700,000 subscribers due to pulling out of Russia, raising prices and rampant password sharing. While increased competition and the loss of subscribers in Russia are something they can't entirely control, Password sharing and higher prices are. Netflix is planning on charging extra for password sharing, and they are planning to add a ad supported tier to their pricing structure. Now, the President Scholars team decided to place a hold on Netflix. We believe that it'll be able to bounce back some, but we are still very wary. We believe that it'll, Netflix has had increasingly negative cash flows from 2012 to the present, with the exception of 2020 during COVID. <clears throat> However, as we watch them struggle to grow their, uh, their base for the first time in their history, we want to see how things play out over the next few quarters. In the long term, we believe they will find a way to grow their subscriber base outlined in the recent report I just sent up, 
But for the meantime, we do recommend a hold on them right now. Next, Luz will be discussing the bond performance. Thank you, Jordan. So though the equity portfolio could not handle the storm, the bond portfolio has come through the storm safely, despite our delay in selling main X and the added volatility caused by PFFD. Uh, we got the big picture right, which was the rising, raising the rising of interest rates. So, um, sorry. So our security selection did hurt us. However, with the expectation of rising interest rates, our lower duration helped us come through the storm. As seen in the near term, um, our numbers are outstanding and we're currently recovering from um, previously lost returns. To more go to more to go more in depth, jo Jordan will be going over our portfolio uh, characteristics. For our fixed income portion, we are underweight, treasuries, securitized, and investment grade. We currently do have a considerable amount of high yield at 23% and preferred at 6%. Now, over the course of the semester, we've been very mindful to maintain a shorter duration than the benchmark, as we've been expecting rates to rise across the curve. Our duration currently sits at 67% of the benchmark, and our credit rating is slightly lower than the benchmarks at eight. Freddie, what's going on in the fixed income space? Jordan, that's an excellent question. Now, before we um, deviate into our bonds, leaders and laggards, I want everyone to take a Quick, fresh breath. Um, you know, breathe in, guys. I know it's it's been a long day, but you know, current TCM class, we're almost there. I can't believe how time has flown away. Speaking of that, I hope you guys remember your bonds class. Let's go back to bond one hundred and one. Professor, Professor Lucas, Professor Kim, and you know, Professor Ko, you also did teach us a little bit about the fixed income space. Let's go back. <laughs> I'm gonna play teacher, and you're gonna play student. So what happens when yields go up? What happens to the bond price? Everybody makes lots of money. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, you're going to get an ass. <laughs> Professor Kim, what happens to bond prices as yields go up? Do they go down? Um, <laughs> you're right in the money. If this was Vegas, you'd be right in the money. <laughs> Jordan, it's been rough. With the rapid rise of interest rate volatility, our bonds have not fared well. Our laggard was preferred, which I'll go over in the next slide. Look, we uh, no, not the, not this one. The next, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the next one. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> just making sure. Wait, <laughs> look, we acknowledge we aren't meteorologists. We're finance professionals, but we looked up into the sky and noticed that there was a storm brewing. And in order to defend ourselves from the storm, we decided that keeping our preferred holding would help us due to its negative correlation to treasury yields. Unfortunately, the storm was Katrina. Market turbulence plagued by fears that a more aggressively monetary tightening could tip us into recession led to a sell-off that shaved about $10 trillion in the U.S. equities market. We knew that interest rates were going to go up, but interest rates spiked faster than we expected. Given persistent inflation and also investors playing the guessing game of what the Fed's going to do, we experienced interest rate volatility. Also, the more inverted yield, also the inverted yield curve, which briefly, you know, we briefly saw it earlier this year. Although we do acknowledge that the inverted yield curve is just, you know, it gives us like an indication that we might go into a recession, but you know, we, we, took, we acknowledge that. But looking at the inverted yield curve and how, how it's gonna single recession, that recession was brewing. Now you may be asking yourself, why do we care about the yield curve? And why do we have Bank of America and Wells Fargo here? Are we promoting them? No, but they are our largest two holdings of um, within our preferred holdings. And given that whenever the yield inverts or if we were to experience uh, you know, a uh, economic slowdown, um, financials and specifically Bank of America and Wells Fargo, which contribute to our largest holdings, would not profit off of the spread. Now, what's next? An advice to the class of 2023, I would recommend you to sell the volatility. Um, just given that the preferred is not doing what we wanted to do, given that it's not providing us the equity returns that we're seeking and also the bond stability we are seeking. Now, Luz, please light in the mood with some positivity and talk about what's the good part of the bond, bonds. All right. Thank you, Freddie. So our inflation protected um, position did carry us this past fiscal year. However, this may not last long. With the rise in interest rates and inflation expectations changing, 
it might be time to reevaluate our holding. The, the five-year break-even yield is 2.92, which is a fair expectation for the average rate of inflation for the following five years. Closely following this, uh, we will hold it for now, but we do suggest um, selling in the near future. So Freddie, how did we get here? Thank you, Luz. Our mission was to chase through to our thesis, which was being objective driven, the low average risk, and ooh, I'm, I'm gonna miss Professor Lucas's phone. <laughs> but let's start again. Our mission was to stay true our, uh, to our thesis, which was being objective driven, the low average risk, and being well diversified. Market turbulence came around, slapped us in the face, and called us a liar. We acknowledge that we went wrong. So, Jordan, where did we go wrong? What did we do wrong? Our woes can really be summarized by good intentions, faulty execution. Throughout the year, we knew what we had to do. And in the beginning of the semester, it was getting rid of those COVID recovery plays. However, this, as the year went on, we repeatedly relied too much on our class late, classmates and refused to take responsibility for it ourselves. We had poor communication with peers and were uncoordinated in terms of who writes what reports. We had several instances where the idea we would have an idea for a report it would take some time to find someone to write said report and then a little bit more time for us to go through multiple iterations just to was just right and by the time we were ready the window of opportunity had passed a perfect example of this is matthew's asia bond fund the previous team chose this bond fund as a way to add global exposure to the portfolio however as covid started to take a toll on chinese markets starting with evergrand it was clear that we had to erase our chinese exposure we decided early on in the semester to remove Mainex. However, it took many iterations to get it just right. And while we're glad we eventually pulled out in January, we would have stood to benefit if we re removed it back in November. Now at the start of the second semester, we acknowledged this issue and attempted to address it, but ultimately we fell victim to the same story. As we reflected on this year, we knew we had the right intentions and even got some of the things done, but we just failed to move with urgency. Our first takeaway from you this year is to adopt a roll up your sleeves and get it done attitude. I got it, I got it. Um, <clears throat> even if it is out of the scope of your position, when things gotta get done, it's our responsibility to get it done. Now, our second takeaway is to really acknowledge and consider tail risks. We've been burnt way too many times this semester by simply ignoring that 5% chance. We have learned that even though a scenario may have a 5% chance of happening, that's not zero. Therefore, we ought to prepare for, or at least be aware of it. Next, Tuan, what happens if we stayed? If we stay, first, we would narrow our focus. At the beginning of the semester, we acted as if the entire class was working for President Scholar. Doing it again, we would prioritize four to five critical choice we must accomplish. Second, we will not let our feelings about the economy overrule our analysis. A prolonged pandemic, rising inflation, Russia invasion of Ukraine, and a partition political environment have taken consumer sentiment down to its lowest level in over a decade. But on average, the S&P 500 returned 24% in the 12 months following a confidence job. It doesn't mean the market will return that much next year. However, it does suggest we should focus on what we own and valuation, not when to buy and sell. And also, as the current markets have created lots of volatility, we should also work extra hard to find new opportunities. Now, Luz will wrap everything up for us. Thank you, Tuan. So if we were to stay moving forward and looking at our base case economic outlook, what would we do? So first, um, we would um, manage below average risk through careful security selection for a more rigorous diversification. We would also change our current 7525 asset allocation to 8020 due to headwinds in the bond market due to interest rates rising. And we would also recommend then recommend selling our higher PE companies. And next a few words of wisdom for the class of 2023. Welcome class of 2023. <laughs> Um, as a little parting gift from the current PS team to you guys, we'd like to all offer just a few words of wisdom. For myself, you get out as much as you put in. Now I've learned so much from the exercises and lectures we do in class. 
<clears throat> but I think I've learned the most when I've intentionally sought out my peers or my professors and asked the right questions. The more questions I asked, the more answers I got. The initiative you take to find these answers it plays a big role in how much you retain. For me, it's giving tough love. It's my first lesson from Professor Lotus. We must push each other in a supportive way to achieve true excellence. If someone wasn't performing well, we must give direct and honest feedback to help that individual improve and to avoid holding back the entire class. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan. Thank you, Jordan, for your words of wisdom. Now it's my turn. Handsome Freddie, before I log off for the rest of the year, class of 23, see two of you here, three of you here, four of you, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a good amount of you. But my advice to you was, you're more you're capable of doing much more than you think don't i know coming in you're going to be really afraid of like hey there's going to be someone that's smarter than you just you know you're capable of so much more than you think so uh, think of so never doubt yourself you're the best <laughs> and to conclude with someone lucas's famous words good enough is better than perfect you don't need to have every specific specific detail right but as long as you get the task finished on time it's way better so that concludes our presentation. We wanted to give a huge shout out to our wonderful professors here and also Jeff for the wonderful donations, our alumni, and also class of 22. Hey, we finished the presentation. We're, we're out of here. I'm just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, honestly. Thank you. Questions? Zoom or in person? Yes, please. <laughs> and maybe you can help me. So, if I understand your portfolio objective is to generate $7,000 towards President of the Scholarship. And of the 200,000, three fourths of the portfolio is invested in growth stocks and, and heavy you know, weightage to tech. I'm trying to understand the reconciliation between your portfolio objective and the investment strategy. That's what I'm struggling with is if you're if that's the portfolio objective, how does this investment strategy match with it? Yes, our objective and our, our real work do not match. That's what we need to work on. And we plan to cut the, the stock with high PA like CIM or this need to cut down our PA and make our portfolio more toward a value portfolio that can perform in all weather. So some of the recommendations on SAW didn't match with what we're talking about. So that's why I just wanted to give you a pause to as you're thinking about that. That will be the question I'll be asking the next team. So. Did you just write the Hasbro cell? No, it was, Who wrote it was the Hasbro it cell. Was, it was me and um, Andy. Okay. Roman. And you've probably seen my comments and I raised that question. There was language in there uh -huh. that the president scholar objective is conservative income and i'm like all right so why are you dumping a 3.3 percent steady yield to buy amazon with no yield so it ties in with uh or dean's comment that and, and there's a disconnect it's okay to have a capital appreciation total return portfolio but don't say you have a conservative strategy when your PE is 26 and the S&P is 19. That doesn't connect at all. Well, I just think this, this portfolio has a different objective. So I do think you probably, uh, you may not have it right. You know, it, it it's probably just needs to be run a little more conservatively. Everybody on Zoom is saying what a great job everyone did and the growth from the fall until the spring has been outstanding so for the incoming class if you do have a little bit of worries about being able to stand up in front of these board members and not sweat through your suit um, you'll get there they didn't get there overnight I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, every that's everybody said really well done yeah good presentation very good